Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I have a really fun and exciting announcement. So it is no secret that some of my closest podcasting friends are the folks that work on Spirits and join the party. Well, last week, we made it official that we are launching a production collective called Multitude. Basically, what it is is a group of friends deciding to get together and make stuff and continue to make stuff in the future. So right now, it is made up of four podcasts. Potterless, obviously, is one of them. Spirits is another, which is basically like drunk history but about mythology. It's amazing. If you're not listening to it, I don't know what you're doing. Join the Party, which is a Dungeons & Dragons podcast where they go through, do the story, and then talk about it afterwards. So the episodes alternate between the story and then talking about the game. It's great. They have amazing sound editing, and you don't have to know anything about Dungeons & Dragons to enjoy it. It's actually a great primer to Dungeons & Dragons. They really explain how it works. And then a new podcast that the Spirits team launched called Waystation, which is a fan cast about Lost Girl, which is a fun Canadian show that they describe as a supernatural maze of bisexuality, friendship, mystery and creative takes on classic mythology so we have gotten together putting our heads together to try to make the four podcasts right now the best that they can be and work on future podcasts later down the road so all that information can be seen at multitude.productions which yes that's the url and uh, you can check it out there i'm really excited to to make this official we've had really fun times on the podcast and on social media interacting so it's really cool to to put a name to it so i think the future of multitude is very bright and i hope you guys check out all the stuff that the team makes in other news i ordered the next batch of shirts so if you are a ten dollar and above patron those shirts are currently being made and sent to me, and then I will send them to you. I ordered some extras. So if you were on the fence about getting a shirt and you want to get it soon, if you are one of the people to join the $10 and above tier on patreon.com slash potterless, you can get a shirt very soon. Similarly, I'm ordering the stickers at the first week of February. So I'm going to be able to get stickers out to the people who are $2 and above patrons. So again, if you want to get that and you want to get it soon, sign up now because I'm going to be hitting that post office and firing off a bunch of packages and envelopes. Speaking of Patreon, we have some amazing new patrons to welcome to the team. Leah Knapp, Emily Epley, Amber Coolis, Ryan King, and Julia Nex. And of course, an enormous shout out to our producer level patrons, Leanne, Andreas, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Michael, Sadie, Emily, Jesse, Maggie, Natalie, Deborah, Daisy, Clow, Michael, Sean, Alexander, Rebecca, Frank, and Marchismo. These amazing producer level patrons have never lost a match of rock, paper, scissors. But without further ado, let's get into the next episode of Potterless, covering chapters 30 through 33 of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, starring Hannah McGregor of the Witch Please podcast. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert, and I am back with the co-host of Which Please and the host of Secret Feminist Agenda, Hannah McGregor. Hannah, how's it going? Oh, so much better than last time we recorded. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I was having a really rough day last time, so mm -hmm. I was way nicer to you than I plan on being tonight. Oh, good. When I'm feeling much better, and thus I'm going to be a lot meaner. Okay, cool. I hope you're ready. I, I think for most people it would be a flip, or like if you're not feeling good, mm -hmm. you'd be grumpy. Mm -hmm. But I'm mm -hmm. glad that uh, I'm glad we'll get the flip side of this for this episode. <laughs> this episode we will be discussing chapters 30 through 33 of Order of the Phoenix, and let's get right to it with chapter 30, Grop, which my first note was Grop with a question mark, uh, and then later learned what that was. Okay. The story of the twins' escape has swept through the entirety of the school, and all the kids think it's the coolest thing ever. All of the teachers are not helping out with the swamp that the twins have left in their wake, much like the fireworks situation. They're kind of letting Umbridge deal with it because they don't like her. Mm -hmm. Some of the students are trying to take the mantle of being the troublemakers in chief, and they're starting to do a lot more pranks to try to establish themselves as the new Fred and George. And the biggest example of this is that people keep letting Nifflers into Umbridge's office. It's happened on multiple occasions, but a Niffler keeps getting into her office, Dung bombs are a constant threat, and there's so many pranksters that Filch can't even keep up. The Inquisitorial Squad keeps getting picked on, and one kid had his skin texture turned into that of cornflakes, mm, which sounds tasty. Delicious. 
<laughs> and Pansy Parkinson was given antlers that took multiple days for Madame Pomfrey to fix. That shit sounds like a pretty good look. Yeah, that's like not that bad. Like you would just look like a cool hipster person. Yeah, apparently reindeer antlers give people like leprosy though. So. Whoa. Like in real life or in the magical <laughs> in, world? In real life. Like there's something on the antlers that yeah, give you leprosy? Uh, you know what? I've, I've read it on the internet and I've never checked. Okay, then it's for certain 100% true. Yeah. And I'm also never touching a reindeer antler just in case. Because what's the best case scenario? You pick up an antler? How often was <laughs> that coming up? I don't know. It was Okay. But let's say I'm in the woods and someone's like, oh, look, there's a reindeer. And so I'm going to be like, look, I don't want to be a leper. So I'm just not yeah. going to touch it. Or I'll wear gloves. One of the two. Skiving snack boxes are running rampant. People are doing them so often in class that uh, that Umbridge was initially giving people detention for doing it, but then like the entirety of the school was in detention, so she couldn't do it. It's just an absolute anarchy. It's a it's an absolute mess. This is literally. I was having this conversation with my students recently about um, refusing to do things that your professors tell you to do, and how the power in a classroom is entirely via consent and if all of you just refuse to do something nobody can make you do it anymore yeah it's true <laughs> I didn't think, nobody <laughs> seems i was like you can just do whatever you want you just have to agree but they should do things like homework and listen to their teachers right mrs mcgregor <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McGregor. Ooh, and Dr. McGregor. Nice. Not for the sake of power itself. Like you, I mean, this whole, the whole, this whole book is about how schools are not inherently good institutions mm -hmm. and you don't inherently need to listen to what your teachers say, right? It's encouraging students to question authority, mm -hmm. to not assume that just because somebody is in control of their institution, of education that that means they should do what they say because umbridge is terrible yeah right so you have to learn how to judge authority figures critically and decide whether you should go along with what they're doing because it's for your own good or mm -hmm. resist yeah it's good because not only does this book teach you that but it also that compounded with the the James Potter stuff kind of tells you like your parents aren't always perfect or adult figures aren't always perfect. So I guess it is a good message, especially for mm -hmm. books that are going to be targeted at a younger audience that, Hey, not everyone is in the right just because they're old. Like adults can make mistakes too. Yeah. It is in fact a book that is seeding young radicals. Ooh, Ooh spicy. Mm -hmm. So Peeves is also wreaking havoc. McGonagall has even helped him with the chandelier prank. So it's just, a, it's a good time. Hermione is concerned about the twins. Ron says that she should worry about Ron rather than the twins because Mrs. Weasley is going to find a way to make this all Ron's fault. Hermione then cites that the twins must have planned this for ages if they have a whole storefront set up. And Ron then says, yeah, that's a good point. I wonder how they got the money. And Harry basically has to confess. Mm. Hermione is mad, which I don't really understand why she's so upset about it and ron is really positive about it mainly because now it's not his fault but also because it was like a nice thing for harry to do later on in the day hermione asks when harry is going to ask snape about occlumency harry is apparently talking in his sleep now according to ron saying just a bit further just a bit further while he has this dream which is not ideal why do you think harry is so resistant to i mean we know why he doesn't want to take occlumency lessons right because obviously mm -hmm. is awful but why is he so resistant to the basic premise that he ought to learn it i think he doesn't want to come to grips with the fact that he, there's something like that there's something wrong with him that he mm. needs to actively address and fix about himself mm -hmm. because he's trying to spin it as a positive way like isn't it nice that you know i can see what voldemort is doing mm -hmm. and then they're like no it can be really dangerous because of the flip side i think harry just doesn't want to realize that something is wrong with him. It's kind of mm. like I'm colorblind and my whole life I was trying to convince myself that I wasn't colorblind. Mm -hmm. I was just like bad at the tests. Mm -hmm. But then when there's certain shades of blue and purple, I think blue is purple and vice versa. So I'm not perfect. So I think it's just a matter of like being a, a stubborn teenager and not wanting to actually admit that there's something wrong with you. Mm. Yeah. And the way that he insists on like believing that it is a good thing that he can see into Voldemort's mm -hmm. mind, right? He wants it to be a strength. He wants it to be a way in which he is a superhero rather than yeah. being something that inherently risks him and his loved ones. Yeah, definitely. So later on, Ron brings up that if Gryffindor wins this upcoming Quidditch match and Slytherin loses their upcoming match against Hufflepuff, 
that Gryffindor has a chance to win the House Cup. <laughs> now, Which is still baffling, right? <laughs> yeah, it's very baffling because it, it somewhat made sense just because the one game that they didn't play with Harry, Ginny caught the snitch. It was the Victor Crumb thing, so they didn't lose by a lot. So the point differential is not the worst. Mm -hmm. But... What is very baffling is that the structure of Quidditch, because what I've gathered now is that they just play each team once and that's it, mm -hmm. which is weird because in previous books, like in the second book, they refer to Harry not being able to play in, quote, the Quidditch Cup final in the first book because he was in a coma. Now, if you're doing this where you just play each team once, there is no final. I guess the only way that there would be a final is if it would happen to be that the last game of the season was between the teams in first and second place. So people just called it the final because then it was whoever won, mm -hmm. won it. But I don't know that JK Rowling is like fully defined how the scheduling works. And it kind of confuses me as someone that really enjoys the drama of playoff sports. Okay, that's what I was like. You are talking like somebody who cares about sports. So I, so I yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not like, <laughs> I really like basketball a lot and I watch baseball <sighs> like every now and then. The thing for me is I don't, I don't watch a lot of dramatic television. Like I don't watch Game of Thrones or, or other like really drama heavy TV shows. So for me, sports drama is like my mm -hmm. drama. Like when there's big mm -hmm. things like an upset or a guy that was on one team and now he's playing against his old team in a playoff game, like things like that really excite me. And I think that they're really fun. And you should like all of the Quidditch in these books. It's sports drama. I, I would. The problem is that there's no structure to it and they aren't consistent. Like in the second book, they say, oh, you know, we had to play a man down because Harry was in a coma. But then in, in the third book, Slytherin substitutes out half their team for really tall people to try to beat up the Gryffindor people. It's like, wait, are you allowed to have substitutions or not? But Slytherin can do whatever they want. <laughs> that, uh, it just, I want there just to be some sort of structure so that I know what counts and what doesn't. Because it kind of feels, I know it's not the same as the rules of magic. But it's kind of like if magic could just make up whatever. It feels like a lot of the Quidditch things are just made up on the spot to fit whatever makes the most drama plot wise. Yes. And it's concerning. Why? I don't know. I just I there should be some sort of structure. Why? Because it's a it's an organized situ it's the school's like organized sport. And there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so integral to the freaking school and the world. And you would think that they would just have some mm. sort of like format, but they don't. Ugh, oh. Frustrates me. Yeah. Are you familiar <laughs> with uh, IRL Quidditch? Yes. And they fix a lot of things, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. I find that really interesting. The, the process through which they had to transform the game in order to make it an actual playable game. Yeah. Um, they, they made they did things that made it a lot more. Make, yeah. make much more sense. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So anyway, there's no final anymore. No. It's just these two games that are going on and Gryffindor has to win. The other thing is that it's based on point differential, but all they say is Slytherin has to lose and Gryffindor has to win, which like isn't true. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Slytherin does lose to Hufflepuff. Gryffindor is playing Ravenclaw. Harry is not confident in Gryffindor's ability to win because they were not that great in the last time. Mm -hmm. Hermione thinks that Ron is actually going to do a lot better with Fred and George gone mm. because she thinks that Fred and George were a bad influence on Ron, kind of making him not have self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Ron is feeling more self-confident technically because he admits that he can't get any worse. So this game has to be better, which yeah. I, I guess is fine. <laughs> Poor Ron. Poor Ron indeed. He's just so mediocre, you know, like he's just not particularly good at anything. Yeah, but he's got a good spirit about him. And he's funny, <laughs> he's so okay. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a, he's a really loyal friend to Harry uh, above all. Sometimes else. I get yeah. Aside from in the book, the fourth, except book, for in every book where they have a huge fight, <laughs> which is really just the fourth, or at least that I've seen. Maybe they have fights in six and seven. But he seems like he's a good friend overall. He's at least a good bro where he like stands up for Harry and stuff. When he, he is a to. good bro, but yeah. mm, I'm not <laughs> sure if that's a quality we admire in people. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so the game starts right off the bat ron gives up a goal and of course the slytherin people start chanting the weasley weasley is our king 
Hagrid is quote unquote hiding in the crowd and tries to make his way through the stands to whisper to Hermione and Harry to come join him immediately because he needs some help. Mm -hmm. He wants them to help them at that specific moment because then the rest of the school will be distracted by the Quidditch match. So as they're walking back to Hagrid's hut, they notice that he's got two black eyes and a bloody nose and even more scratches on his face, which is becoming a common theme. And this is the point where I realize, oh, Grop has to be whatever he's about to show them. Mm -hmm. I did not guess that it was going to be a giant, but that's what Grop is. So they go with him. They enter the Forbidden Forest. Hagrid brings a crossbow, which they are concerned by. Mm -hmm. And when they ask him why he picked it up, they said that it's because the centaurs are now livid that Ferenzi has gone. They don't like that he mm -hmm. is serving Dumbledore. They think that it's this weird thing where it's centaurs admitting defeat and inferiority to humans. Mm -hmm. So they've gotten really rowdy and territorial about, you know, being in the Forbidden mm -hmm. Forest. Yeah, and also the Forbidden Forest is full of terrible monsters that want to murder you, so you yep. should always have a crossbow. Also very valid. <laughs> so they apparently, the centaurs attacked Ferenzi and Hagrid had to save them, and mm -hmm. now because of that, they hate Hagrid. Hence, mm -hmm. the crossbow. Hagrid does admit that they are not what he needs to show them. So they go deep into the forest, and Hagrid, while they're going into the forest, admits that he's afraid that he's going to get sacked because of the Niffler thing, which he has not done, but he's afraid that he's going to get blamed for it because it's a magical creature. Mm. Hagrid said that he would leave the school right now to save his dignity and to go help out Dumbledore if it wasn't for what he's about to show them, but what he's going to show them is holding him back. When they get there, what it appears to be is this big mound of dirt that is mm -hmm. breathing and grunting, but then it gets up... And it turns out that it's a giant. Hermione and Hagrid, before this big reveal, though, have a back and forth where they're being super vague. And Hermione keeps saying, why would you bring it if it didn't want to come? They keep saying it, 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 it. Mm -hmm. And I at first thought that it was going to be a baby giant. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that it's a fully grown giant, so to speak. It's Hagrid's half-brother. Mm -hmm. who is named Grop. It's the name that Hagrid gave him. And he's mm -hmm. 16 feet tall, which apparently is tiny in terms of giants. What do you think of the fact that they refer to Grop as an it? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think that giants have a different gender system than we do. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess it could be seen as progressive because we would want Grop to say what his gender is or what he yeah. identifies but, as but we use they not it as a oh yeah that is now. i was gonna say that it is very true it's super dehumanizing you use it to describe a lamp yeah we've used they to refer to people whose gender we don't know for i mean you use it naturally without thinking about it you just yeah. you yeah, say yeah. like you know i ran into a person at the mall and they told me that i should go left at the next like mm -hmm. but you wouldn't say i ran into a person at the mall and it, it. told me yeah no that's super degree you would never do that right so the it exactly. is like a really clear way of signaling that like the giant is other and not human and yeah that sucks and you would think that hagrid would correct hermione saying it because mm. hagrid is very defensive when people like umbridge think less of hagrid specifically because he's half giant yeah you would think that Hagrid's natural reaction would be like, hey, don't call him an it, call him him or they if he hasn't, you know. Yeah, yeah that sucks. I didn't realize it, but that's, uh, I thought they just mm -hmm. kept saying it to try to be vague so that the reader doesn't know, but they do keep calling him it after yeah. the fact too, which yeah. is concerning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the treatment of giants in the series is real. I've been thinking about it a lot since I saw somebody talk recently about um, the role of giants in medieval literature, mm -hmm. which is like a lot of the inspiration for Rowling's work. Like she's drawing on a lot of old British myth and uh -huh. like old tropes from British literature. And um, Marcel and I talk a lot about goblins and their representation, but I didn't know much about how giants are represented. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw some really interesting stuff about um essentially sort of giants as this this monstrous other figure that you usually represents like a foreign invader so that they're like super racialized they're not just regular monsters they're like racialized monsters interesting that suggests the sort of savagery and incivility and monstrosity of those who come from elsewhere mm -hmm. and so when you think about the giant as a sort of racialized figure then you can think like why is Grop so monstrous? Why does he have to be kept out in the forest? Why is Hagrid so panicked about people knowing he's a giant? Why does he hide it? Why is he sensitive about it? Because it's attached to all of this stigma. 
Yeah. That we can also read as a sort of allegory for race in the books. Yeah, this was something we talked about in a previous episode of Potteros with Kelly and Alex is that it, it goes a little bit farther than just thinking less of giants, but thinking a lot less and having, you know, mm-hmm. racism type thoughts towards it. Mm-hmm. And it is concerning that the wizarding world is kind of set up in a way that tries to set off a a hierarchy of species. Mm -hmm. Like even when you think less of Lupin for being a werewolf, Lupin is Mm -hmm. one of the best professors that Hogwarts has ever had, but everybody is afraid of him just because he's a werewolf. So you're right that like this introduction to Grop would have been a great part for J.K. Rowling to write Hagrid standing up for him as a good lesson. And Mm -hmm. it seems like a really big missed opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. When we do get to Grop, the way that he's described is like really... You know, he's really monstrous. Yeah. Man, that's a bummer. Well, (laughs) what we learn is that Hagrid brought him back from the journey because he was so tiny that he was getting picked on by the other giants. That was the reason that Maxime and him split up because Maxime was like, look, I can't keep dealing with this because he's, Mm. you know, so big and causing problems and accidentally hurting things and breaking stuff and all this other stuff. So Maxime and him split. Hagrid says that if he leaves or gets sacked, he wants Harry and Hermione to look after him just by keeping him company every now and then. Harry describes the giant as not looking exactly human, kind of like human-esque, but a little deformed. Mm -hmm. Like the head shape is really round and it doesn't exactly look like a person. And we learn that this is the thing that Frenzy was warning about a couple chapters ago with the, he would have been better to abandon it. Mm -hmm. Harry and Hermione begrudgingly agree because they don't really have a choice. And Hagrid decides that he's gonna wake him up so that Grop can meet the two, which Hermione thinks is a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. Grop wakes up, he starts tearing up trees and knocking them down and ripping out their roots and all that. Hermione and Harry are absolutely shook and terrified on the walk back. And the three of them start to leave and walk back, and the centaurs come in. We meet a new centaur named Megorian, who is the new leader. And Bane, who was one of the guys that we met before, the one that like tried to attack Harry before Frenzy Mm -hmm. saved him in the first book he's also there Mm -hmm. so there's a bit of a back and forth between the centaurs and Hagrid Mm -hmm. but basically Hagrid and the kids are allowed to keep going and make their way out scot-free I want to touch on one little piece of that interaction which is that um, there is a back and forth between Hagrid and Bane about who owns the Forbidden Forest. Yes, there is. And the question of exactly whose territory that is and whether that is like a common land that everybody is allowed access to or whether it belongs to the centaurs, which is really interesting because it's very clear according to the centaurs that that is their territory and that is only through their permission that others access it. Um, And as far as Hagrid is concerned, he has the right to go on it as much as he wants. Yeah, I don't really know what the official right stance on this is because I don't know how it all came to be because that hasn't been explained yet so I don't know if this is like a Native American white people stealing their land situation or if there like was an agreement set upon Mm -hmm. by the centaurs and whoever was the the headmaster of Hogwarts at the time and then now these new centaurs are just being sassy about it so I don't know and I don't know if there's an official writing of like how it came to be in something on Pottermore like Hogwarts history or whatever just ignore Pottermore's existence. It's real shit show. Um, oh, just, man. <laughs> just keep it in mind as you were thinking about the uh, status of different kinds of a sort of non-wizard, non-witch magical creatures in the world. Okay. Because the status of centers is really interesting as well, right? Because they're, yeah. they're, not, they're not dehumanized in the same way that uh, giants are because giants are like, you know, these sort of big, violent, monstrous figures. The centers yeah. are hyper-intelligent. Yes. Um. And so they have a different relationship to uh, to the wizards than, than the giants do. They definitely do. Mm-hmm. The squad returns back to the game. Hermione is still absolutely flabbergasted by what Hagrid has asked them to do. And now it's just, it's just Harry and Hermione at the game. And they hear people singing Weasley is our king, but then they realize that it is a positive rendition of Weasley is our king (laughs) sung by the Gryffindors. They've changed the lyrics so that they talk about how Ron saved lots of quaffles and didn't let Mm -hmm. the quaffle in and all that kind of stuff like that. So you find out that Gryffindor won and they won by so many points that they win the Quidditch World Cup, of course. God, not the Quidditch World Cup. Oh, sorry, the Quidditch (laughs) House Cup. They win the Quidditch House Cup because they have enough points. And this 
this is a point in my notes where I went on yeah. an all caps rage saying like, what? You, what? No, but it's we've pretty already anticlimactic. It. it really oh, is. Very, it is, yeah. very anticlimactic, especially since we learned that they were in contention in the beginning of this chapter. And then it's like, Hey, by the way, we won at the end. Yeah. How much is this like how soccer works? Because I know that's also like points base accrued over the whole season based on how much you win or lose by. It is similar in some ways. So there, every league does it differently. But for major league soccer, for example, which has teams from the U.S. and Canada, the way that they do the playoffs is that you play um, you play two games. So one, say, you know, say Seattle and Toronto were in a, a match between oh, each so other. This is so terrible. I don't actually care. Okay. Oh, Basically, no. <laughs> I'll do it quick. One, each t- they play two games. And then whoever at the end of those two games has the most points of the goal differential. So if one team won five to zero and then the other team won the next game seven to zero, the team that won seven to zero goes on. But the final of that tournament is still just like team A versus team B and then whoever wins wins. So you'll get the point differential thing usually determines seeding as well as who plays who or if who advances. Like it, it's always often the tiebreaker mm-hmm. in terms of um, if people have the same record. But usually something like this would happen to determine which two teams went to a final and then they yeah. would go head to head, which is what I thought was the structure in the first book. But now we've learned isn't. <laughs> <laughs> So it is unconventional to not have a final. Mm, Okay. So then we get into chapter 31, Owls, or O-W-L-S. Ron is on cloud nine because he has helped the Gryffindor team win and he didn't suck. Yeah, he's good at something. I take it back. I'm being too hard on Ron. He's also good at chess. (laughs) He is. He's good at wizard Mm -hmm. chess. So he is telling stories, ruffling his hair, becoming very James Potter-esque, and Harry takes Mm. note of this. Ron says that Ginny sealed the deal in the game by getting the snitch right under Cho's nose, which I think is a great parallel of how Ginny takes Harry away right under Cho's nose to marry Harry. (laughs) The parallels. Harry is little better than an object. That is true. (laughs) When, When Ron tells him this about Cho just missing the snitch, Harry says, I bet she cried really bitterly because Harry's being a grumpy 15 year old boy Mm -hmm. harry and hermione unfortunately have to admit to ron that they didn't see the match and ron is really disappointed but Mm -hmm. then they say what happened and he is no longer upset he understands and he shares hermione's opinion that hagrid is being absolutely ridiculous (laughs) this might be a bad idea (laughs) yeah so all the students are freaking out about the owls ernie is that guy who keeps talking about how many hours of studying he's been doing. It's like, I've been studying for eight hours a day. It's like, shut up, Ernie. Nobody likes that person. This is fucking, when you get to grad school, it's literally 100% of the people. Uh, it's everyone. It's everyone being like, I haven't slept in four months. Uh, You're like, it's a pissing contest. Fuck of, off. Uh, That's not impressive. I hate it. I hate that so much. I'm so glad I didn't do grad school. <laughs> yeah. Malfoy is not worried because his dad is apparently chummy with the grader at the ministry. Mm -hmm. He thinks that that's going to mean he's going to get good grades. But Neville tells the squad, he's like, I don't think that that's very true because my grandma is really tight with that lady. And she's never mentioned the Malfoys ever. So hopefully justice will be served. We later on meet Griselda Marchbanks and she's fantastic. So I trust her to not, you know, give in to Lucius Malfoy. All these kids around school are trying to sell like potions and powders to help with studying. Hermione explains that they're all scams, citing that one of them is dried poop. So. (laughs) But like one of them is for sure just Ritalin. (laughs) Somebody has gotten their hands on like just a little, just some methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. Just to introduce that into the wizarding world. Yep. Not the best. So Mm. you learn that the owls are spread out over two weeks. There is a theory exam in the morning, so like a test test, and then a practical exam in the afternoon. So doing things with your wand in front of examiners. Mm -hmm. There's anti-cheating charms on all the paper. There's lots of prohibited items. All these different rules of ways you can't cheat. The examiners enter, led by Griselda Marchbanks, who asks where Dumbledore is right off the bat. Umbridge says she doesn't know. But she will find him soon. And Griselda says, no, that's not happening. (laughs) (laughs) So the kids start taking their owls exams. Charms is the first one. It goes okay for Harry, but he switched 
a growing spell with a coloring spell. So he made a rat giant instead of making it orange. And then Ron's like, oh yeah, I messed up one too. I turned a dinner plate into a giant mushroom, but I don't know what the hell I did. And that makes Harry feel a lot better. He's like, well, at least I didn't screw up that badly. Mm-hmm. Hermione is freaking out afterwards. She's that person in class that is like going through every single test question that she wasn't sure of and trying to reason why she thought her answer was correct. Ron and Harry just tell her to shut up. She eventually leaves after this one, and Ron says, I think she'll be fine. Remember that time she got a 112% on a charms exam last year? So she'll be okay. Yeah, she'll be okay, but, like, Hermione's obsession with perfecting magic literally saves their lives multiple times throughout this series. It does. And they need to, like, calm down at mocking her overachieving. Yeah, they do. Because they would both be dead without it. Yep. It's so true. It is so true. The book then kind of breezes through the rest of the finals, but it does note that Harry absolutely destroys his defense against the dark arts exam. Mm -hmm. For a bonus point in the practical portion of the exam, he makes a Patronus because the examiner is like, now I've heard that some of you students know how to make Patronuses. If you can do one, Harry, I'll give you a bonus point. So he has to have a happy thought to channel it. He looks at Umbridge in the face and then imagines her getting fired. And that's his happy thought. And it works flawlessly, like big old stag, perfect form. I think that's incredible. That's so good is the hypothetical thought of her getting fired is enough to make him make a Patronus. <laughs> to make him make a Patronus. Yep, that was um, <laughs> that was a good pause. <laughs> it's almost like it's a parallel for something. Mm-hmm. So then they cut to the practical exam for astronomy, which is at midnight, which is way too late. Like you could definitely have this exam at like 830. There's I think having it at midnight is obnoxious especially when they're going to have exams the next morning. It's crazy to me that they have the exam at midnight. It's pr- it's entirely reasonable. To have it at midnight? That is so late. Like, the darkness difference between 10 p.m. and midnight is negligible. It's probably not about darkness level. It's probably about the position of the stars. Ah, uh, maybe. But is two hours really going to make or break? I mean, are you a magical astrologer? No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> But I am someone that understands that sleep is important. Absolutely no reason for me to side with the books over you on this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. (laughs) It's good. It's good. Get a good dialogue. So all the kids have to fill out a star chart with telescopes. They're on Mm -hmm. a tower in Hogwarts. While they're doing this exam, Harry gets distracted because he notices some sort of commotion at Hagrid's cabin. It turns out that it's Umbridge and a crew apparently trying to sack Hagrid. And he's not going quietly. Mm -hmm. Fang is barking up a storm as well. And they try to hit Hagrid with some stunning charms, but they just bounce off Hagrid. We later learn that they bounced off him because giant's blood is naturally resistant to charms. So the, the spells that they're doing doesn't really work on Hagrid, but they do get Fang with the stunning charm, which is really sad. McGonagall then walks across the lawn from the castle to Hagrid's hut. And while she's doing that, she's yelling, like, leave him alone. There's no need for this. Like, no need to take him away forcefully. Blah, 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 blah. He hasn't done anything wrong. He doesn't deserve being sacked, etc. And four of the people that are with Umbridge shoot stunning charms at McGonagall. And they all hit her in the chest at the same time. She flies into the air like she levitates off the ground and then smacks flat on her back against the dirt. Which is terrifying because she's an old lady. Uh, you just, just try to kill McGonagall. Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> old lady, my ass. Exactly. This causes Professor Tofty, who's the examiner of the astronomy final that they're doing, to say galloping goblins, meaning that he is Robin from Adam West's Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Trelawney then brings McGonagall to the hospital wing. And that night after the exam, all the kids are talking about it. While they're talking about it, you learn that the Niffler is Lee Jordan. And he feels really bad because he's afraid that they <laughs> thought. I was like, what? No. <laughs> Jordan is a Niffler? Sorry. Niffler nope. is responsible for the yep. Niffler. <laughs> and he feels really bad because he's like, oh, no, I hope they didn't think that Hagrid was the Niffler one. It was me. I was trying to be silly. Yeah, they were going to fire Hagrid anyway. Don't worry about it, Lee. <laughs> Harry gets almost no sleep that night because he's very shocked about what he just witnessed. And also the fact that he had a final at midnight. So he goes to bed really tired and he doesn't get a lot of sleep. And the next morning he goes to his history of magic exam, just absolutely exhausted. He is struggling on some of the questions, though he does reveal at one point that vampires do exist in the wizarding world, which I think is interesting that we haven't heard about them. Mm, Yeah, no, they're mentioned 
Uh, definitely in the second book. The second book's the Lockhart book, right? Yes. One of his books is about vampires. Oh, okay. True. Yeah. True, true, true. I, I'm, yeah. I'm intrigued that they haven't gone more into things like vampires, but they exist. Harry is stuck on one question about the International Federation of Wizards that they had a holdout on the Wizards of Liechtenstein because of a goblin issue. And while he's going back and forth and trying to remember what the answer is, he falls asleep and he has the dream again. Mm. So he's back in the orb room, you know, which is through the door. So he's in the one with all the dusty glass orbs. He turns left at row number 97. This is the second time he's done this. And then out loud, as he goes farther down this row, he finds like a particular glass orb. And then out loud, his voice is, take it for me, lift it now. I cannot touch it, but you can. And obviously this is Voldemort speaking. There is a man crumpled up on the floor being ordered around and constantly hit with Crucio. And the man on the ground raises his shoulders, lifts his head, has a bloody face, says, you'll have to kill me. And then the book says, whispered serious, which oh, it's serious black. <laughs> 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 so uh, then mm. Harry's voice of Voldemort says, undoubtedly, I shall in the end, which I think is terrible foreshadowing. I'm I predict that Sirius will die. And this makes me sad that this is probably some foreshadowing. He says, undoubtedly, I shall in the end, but you must fetch it for me first, Black. And he threatens to hurt him more. Here's a voice behind him, which I think is still in the dream. There's some other voice in the room. But then Harry wakes up to the Grand Hall freaking out because Harry has been, you know, probably mm. screaming while this is going on. Sleep screaming again, just like he yep. does. And that's the end of chapter 31. And we get into chapter 32, which is called Out of the Fire. Mm -hmm. Harry is screaming that he doesn't need to go to the hospital wing as people are actively bringing him to the hospital wing, which further makes it seem like you need to go to the hospital wing. Like, never a good luck. When Poor you're Harry. <laughs> I mean, this really dramatically undermines his attempt to pretend that he is just a normal student yeah like, oh yes you can't you gotta do less public screaming yeah it's different than in than before when like his scar hurt so much that he fainted that's that's you know someone could have a really bad migraine and that could happen that's conceivable but to be like audibly screaming like ah, bleh, like whatever yelping noises he's making in the middle of a final exam is concerning it's an uncomfortable look when you are a teenager yes definitely so he gets to madame pomfrey and frantically asks her where McGonagall is so that he can tell her about the dream because Harry's like, oh, Sirius is in trouble. I got to tell somebody. It's just like the Mr. Weasley thing. Yeah, except that he can't say anything. He can say something about Weasley because he's like allowed to know where he is, but like he's not allowed to know where Sirius Black is. Yes, exactly. So Pomfrey says that McGonagall has been transferred to St. Mungo's, mm -hmm. uh, which is really sad. And Pomfrey also notes that she is shocked that she didn't die from it given her age. But as you said earlier, just try and kill McGonagall. No, no, not a fucking chance. <laughs> Harriet then at this point then realizes that he has no one to tell with Hagrid, McGonagall, and Dumbledore gone. He realizes that his closest ally is Snape, Whoops. which is not ideal Whoops. for Harry Potter. <laughs> Pomfrey says that she is incredibly fed up with umbridge's control of the school and says that she would leave but she's staying to take care of the kids because she knows that she's the only person that can deal with all the craziness that's going on oh, and that is just uh madame pomfrey is the true unsung hero of the series she's incredible yeah she really is and she's great in the movies oh good i'm excited i don't think i've seen her in the first four yet or if i have it's been very minimal yeah. it's yeah i think i've seen her it's just been very just her being like sassy briefly she hasn't really been a major factor so eventually Harry is let out, and when he is, he runs and tells Hermione and Ron. Mm -hmm. Hermione doesn't think that it's happening right now, because it's five in the afternoon, mm -hmm. and they are the two most wanted wizards in the world, so surely they couldn't have just waltzed into the Ministry of Magic into a secret hidden room. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is brilliant, this has to be it, and I totally fell for it. She thinks it's Voldemort playing a trick in Harry's mind mm -hmm. using... Uh, like reverse uh, legitimacy. Yep. I was going to call it reverse occlumency. Yeah, I mean, same, same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you think? So at the point now, because we do this chapter in the next one, like they do the, mm -hmm. they do the flu powder thing and, and there's no one there. Mm -hmm. I was really believing Hermione, but after going through the flu powder thing, mm -hmm. like I think it might be real. Either that or it is a very 
clever scheme because you do learn that creature is in on it because he was smiling before. And then when you talk to him, he's like real giddy Mm -hmm. about it. He heavily implies Bellatrix being back. So I think that it is either he's actually there and Harry is right, which I don't want to think. But Mm -hmm. what it could be is just like an elaborate scheme where, yes, Sirius and Lupin are are out of Grimmauld Place, Mm -hmm. but Bellatrix just has them and they're not Mm -hmm. actually in the Ministry of Magic, the, the the Department of Secrets, but Voldemort is using a trick to do that. That's good. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pick that. I think that's my guess. Mm, yeah. Because I think it would be too weird for Harry to be right. Yeah. I really, <laughs> really like this phrase, this passage where Hermione says, um, this isn't a criticism, but you do sort of, um, <laughs> you've got a bit of a, a saving people thing. Yep. Yep, <laughs> which yep. Is, which is like an incredible sort of Gryffindor on Gryffindor burn because that's supposed to be mm-hmm. like their whole shtick. But it's like, yeah. here, you take it a bit far and yep. you're sort of like naive, straightforward, thoughtless, rash heroism makes you really easy to manipulate. Mm-hmm. His, his saving people thing is a bit problematic. So it's good that Hermione brings it up. So the squad is trying to figure out what's going on. Ron brings up that Sirius's brother was a Death Eater, and maybe he told Sirius how to get the weapon, so that's why Dumbledore keeps him locked up. Hermione moves on very quickly, which means that this actually might be what happened, because Hermione does not take the time to be like, Ron, that was dumb. So it could be that thing where like Ron is actually right some of the times when he makes outlandish guesses, so that could be a factor. I do think that Bellatrix is heavily involved in this, based on what how Creature reacts, mm-hmm. so we'll have to see. Hermione tells Harry to calm down and, as you said, fight his urgency to always save people. Mm -hmm. Hermione says that Voldemort knows you, so he is probably trying to put stuff into your mind so that Harry opens it up, etc., etc. Harry thinks it's real and is being really stubborn about it. And then Ginny and Luna enter. Mm -hmm. Harry kind of barks at them right away. And Ginny immediately says, don't talk to me that way. I just want to help, which is great. I'm loving Ginny. Ginny in this book is killing it. She's not putting up with Harry's bullshit, Mm -hmm. and it's amazing. Harry says that she can't help, and Luna then calls him rude. So I'm really liking just this sort of parallel of, like, people standing up to Harry. It's very much like Lily standing up to James. Mm -hmm. It's something Harry needs in his life. Hermione says that they need to use Umbridge's fire again. They need to try to figure out if people are in Grimald Place to determine whether or not it's Voldemort playing a trick on Harry's brain. Mm -hmm. So they devise a plan. They talk about Sirius multiple times, and then Luna says... When you say serious, do you mean Stubby Boardman doing a callback to that Mm. Quibbler article? And then the book says, quote, nobody answered her, which is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) So the plan is that Ron is going to tell Umbridge that Peeves is smashing up the Transfiguration Department. Luna and Ginny are going to stand on each end of Umbridge's hallway saying that someone is laying down garroting gas, which is gas that just smells horrible and is invisible. Hermione is surprised at how quickly Ginny came up with this, and Ginny admits that the twins were going to do it anyway, but they already (laughs) left. (laughs) So Harry only agrees with the plan because Hermione volunteers to go into Umbridge's office with him, which shows him that she has to be serious. Or serious, am I right? (laughs) Nope. Nope. Absolutely. You were asked that joke made absolutely no sense. Oh, it was sitting right there. So Seamus and Dean are planning uh, an end of exam celebration. They say that they're going to get, quote, black market butter beers, which I'm wondering, does that mean that they're more alcoholic butter beers? And they also mentioned that they're going to get fire whiskey from someone who I'm assuming is an older student. So it's a very much like high school or college party where they're like paying someone older than them to buy booze for them, which I think is Mm -hmm. funny. The plan then is underway. The distress signal is that the kids will start singing Weasley is our king if someone is about to enter Umbridge's office. Mm -hmm. So they get into the office. They do the flu powder thing. They get to Grimald Place. They see that it is empty aside from Creature, who has bandages on his hands, which I think is suspect. Mm -hmm. He's being really sassy and says that everyone is gone and that he's going to have a chat with his mistress because Master has kept him from her. So this is Bellatrix. As Creature is about to leave and ignore them, he does confirm that Sirius is in the Department of Mysteries, which doesn't necessarily mean that he's actually there. It could be all part of the scheme. But he does tell the students that Sirius is in the Department of Mysteries, which kind of makes me think more that it is a lie that he was in on. Mm -hmm. Because if he was really trying to be a good master... Bellatrix would have ordered him, like, don't tell anyone where Sirius is. Mm -hmm. So this is really making me think 
that it's all a big plot. Feels like a trap. Yeah, it really does. So Umbridge yanks the squad out of the fire, and you find out that she put some sort of spell on the doorway to see when people entered. So she starts interrogating them. Malfoy's in there too. All the accomplices, plus Neville, are kind of bound up and gagged by Umbridge's squad. So apparently Neville got looped into the mix because he was trying to stop Malfoy from hurting Ginny, which is the sweetest thing. Absolutely yeah. so sweet. Neville's a prize. Oh, yeah. Umbridge asks who he was talking to. Harry won't budge. She sends Malfoy to get Snape for Veritaserum, mm-hmm. which is scary. This is the point when Harry then realizes that Snape is his closest ally Mm -hmm. because he's the only person that's in the order at the school. So he's like, crap, I need to try to side with Snape and figure something out when he comes here. And you would think that Snape would not want to side with Umbridge in any way. And you learn that he doesn't want to. So she brings Snape in, asks him for Veritaserum. He says he's out of Veritaserum. She says, well, why don't you make more? And he says, it'll take a month, which I don't know if that's true or not, but at least Snape does. It seems like he is lying just to try to not allow Umbridge to use it on Harry. Because of this answer, she puts Snape on probation immediately, which is, you know, really the anger getting to her head. Harry tries to think in his brain of a message, hoping that Snape is mm. is legitimacying Harry's mind without saying anything. And he realizes that this might not actually He's work. Like, oh shit, I never actually learned how to do this magic. <laughs> yep. So as Snape is about to leave, Harry yells, he's got Padfoot in the place that is hidden, mm. which is great. So smart by Harry. Absolutely genius. So proud of him for thinking of this. And Umbridge asks Snape, what does this mean? Snape says, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. And sh- so he leaves. She's about to use Crucio on Harry, which is absurd. <laughs> Absolutely. Child ridiculous. torture. Yeah. It's just, she's so comically over the top evil. Yep. Like, yep. Voldemort's like an actual monster. Yeah. But Umbridge is just. She's not. She hasn't sided with Voldemort. She's not a Death Eater. Exactly. She's just. She's just a bureaucrat run rampant. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she's willing to take it to the point of child torture is wild. It's really, it's really crazy. Cause yeah, it's, it's this thing where like she is doing things on par with what Voldemort does, Mm -hmm. but you're exactly right. One of them is Satan (laughs) and the other one is a principal. (laughs) (laughs) It's a little different when you're doing the same thing. So she wants to use Crucio, which is not cool. And Hermione is screaming at the top of her lungs, trying to reason with her. Like Fudge would not want this. This is horrible. Harry, just tell her the truth. Blah, blah, blah. She's being absolutely frantic because who would want to see your friend that is 15 years old, get Crucio. Mm-hmm. So Hermione starts breaking down, crying and sobbing, saying that she is going to tell Umbridge the truth so that she won't hurt Harry. Mm-hmm. Harry at first is upset, but then he notices that there's no actual tears rolling down Hermione's eyes, meaning that she's playing them, mm-hmm. which is great. So she's totally got something up her sleeve. She keeps up the crying and Hermione lies that Harry was trying to speak to Dumbledore with the fire. The entire crew goes like, like with their faces really (laughs) obviously. But the narrator notes that thankfully everyone was staring at Hermione because otherwise if anyone was looking, they would have noticed the facial reactions. So Hermione says that the plan was to tell Dumbledore that the weapon was ready. Mm -hmm. Hermione says that they want to show the whole school the weapon. Umbridge says that she will have Harry and Hermione lead her to it first. Malfoy butts in saying that he can help and Umbridge yells at him just really quickly quips at him goes I'm a ministry official you don't think I can handle a couple of teenagers Mm. (laughs) which is amazing (laughs) so she instructs Malfoy and the rest of the goons to watch over the rest of Harry and Hermione's accomplices and my prediction here is that they're going to lead them to Grop fun fact I'm wrong so (laughs) chapter 33 the last chapter that we're covering in this episode is called fight and flight and it's a pretty short chapter they head into the Forbidden Forest, and at this point, I'm like, yup, totally going to grop. Mm-hmm. And it says, Harry had no idea what Hermione had in mind. And in my notes, I'm like, oh, Harry, you fucking idiot. It's clearly grop. I'm dumb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Umbridge, Umbridge sends the kids to walk in front of her, specifically like human shielding her, because, quote, the ministry values my life more than yours. <laughs> like, yeah. like, they're children. Yeah. Come on. I mean, she's not wrong. She's not wrong, but it is concerning 
Harry is confused when they start to go on the path, not towards Grop, mm -hmm. but towards where Aragog was. And this is where I've written in my notes, oh no, am I wrong? <laughs> is it the centaurs instead? Yeah. And then it is the centaurs. Mm -hmm. So I was right the second time. So they go deep, deep, deep into the forest and about 50 centaurs approach them after they like shoot warning bow and arrows at them. Megorian approaches them, asks Umbridge who she is, and she says that she's from the ministry. She warns them about her authority over half-breeds, which is a poor decision mm -hmm. for a group of people that don't like that wizards think they're better than them. Yeah, it's just rude to call people half-breeds in general. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you make a good point there because Bane, in particular, gets super pissed off when she says half-breeds. Yeah. He's like, what did you just call us? <laughs> so very demeaning and thankfully called out immediately. So she keeps trying to pick a fight with them and explaining her superiority over them. When I first finished this, I, I called my girlfriend after we were talking about it. And I was like, I was like, why was she so dumb? Like, why did she keep trying to pick a fight with them? And Kelly was just like, Mike, she's super racist. She's like, that's what racists do. I was like, oh, right. Mm. That is what they do. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> like, she just can't, she can't live with the thought that, other people who she thinks are inferior to her think that they are at even equal with her yeah. and How dare they? just can't bear to live with that thought. So she just keeps trying to assert her superiority, which is ultimately her downfall. She calls them all sorts of names. It's going south very quickly. She tries to use the rope spell on Megorian. The rest of them just charge her. Bane picks her up. Another one then stomps on her wand and they just carry her deep into the forest and that's the story of how Umbridge got murdered because she was racist. She's gone. They haven't said what's happening, but I'm imagining they're going to tear her apart. But we'll see what happens. I have a lot of thoughts on what happens to Umbridge, but I don't want to spoil them. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, the other centaurs are contemplating harming the kids, too, because they say, hey, they brought her here. Mm -hmm. Hermione says that they only brought her here so that the centaurs would get rid of her. But that does not go well, because then they're like, oh, you just want us to do your bidding? Yeah. So not the smartest thing for Hermione to say. No. It's really not looking good, and this gray centaur is all up on his high horse, which... A, giving a speech about how, you know, superior the the centaurs are, blah, blah, blah. But then Grop comes in, and mm. he says Hagar over and over again, which clearly is Hagrid. See, Mrs. Hagrid. And the narrator Harry is like, Harry keeps thinking, what does Hagar mean? It's like, dude, come on. Yeah, Harry's really dumb. He's very dense. <laughs> When Hermione tells Harry that he means Hagrid, Grop then says Hermie. And Hermie is something earlier on. Hagrid, when he woke up Grop, was trying to introduce them to Hermione and Harry and was trying to get Grop to say their names. And Grop could not say Hermione. He just said Hermie. So mm -hmm. this was something I didn't think was going to be a big thing. I didn't even write in my notes initially. But apparently it worked. And Grop remembers who Hermione is and knows that she's good and friends of Hagrid. So because of that... He starts fighting off the centaurs, and it allows the kids to run away. Harry is mad at Hermione for the plan not being perfect and then for it taking so much time, which I think is very silly of Harry because it's like, dude, she still got you out of there. Yeah. Like, you can't get mad at her for it not being flawless. She fixed that problem. But also, everybody's just feeling real stressed out. Yeah, yeah. Why true. do you think Hermione's plan was to bring... Umbridge to the centaurs rather than Grop. I think with the centaurs, she she knew how it would happen. Like she knew that the centaurs wouldn't like Umbridge and that Umbridge wouldn't like them. And it's it's like if you bring him to Grop, you don't know if Grop is gonna be he's like more he's unpredictable. Mm -hmm. You don't know if he's gonna be mad at Umbridge or if he'll do anything or if he'll just like ignore her or if he even knows that Hermione's a good guy. Yeah. Whereas the centaurs, it is pretty safe to assume that they're not going to like Umbridge right off the bat mm -hmm. because she's a teacher at the school. Yeah. But then you compound that with the fact that she works for the ministry and then you know Umbridge is going to do some racist shit towards the centaurs. I think Hermione just kind of put all those pieces together and realized this is a more surefire thing. Yeah. I wonder if she also recognizes that Grop is kind of vulnerable, like despite yeah. being so, so large and powerful. It's like ultimately Hagrid did leave him in your care. Mm -hmm. It would be like, a violation of that trust to use him as a weapon. Yep. Very true. Very, very true. Harry gets mad at the plan not being perfect. Hermione says, oh, come off it. How would you have even gotten to London anyway? And then Ron says, yeah, how would you? Which is surprising because they should have been tied up. So him and the crew show up. They're all beat up with like bloody noses and black eyes and bruises and all that. 
So clearly they got into some sort of fight with the goons. Mm -hmm. Ron says that they use some spells that they learned in Dumbledore's army lessons to break free. Apparently Neville and Ginny specifically did very well. So they catch everybody up to speed and they say that they need to get to Sirius. Luna suggests that they take the Thestrals, which just showed up since Harry and Hermione were covered in blood and they like oh. blood. <laughs> <laughs> that made the Thestrals show up. Uh -huh. So Ron and Harry at first don't want Ginny and Luna joining. Why not? Or Neville. Yeah, they don't want Ginny, Neville, or Luna joining. But those three then cite that they were all in Dumbledore's army with them. Uh -huh. And the whole point of Dumbledore's army is to fight Voldemort with it. Then Ginny brings up the fact, I'm three years older than you were in the first book. <laughs> That's what she spe says specifically. I mean, I'm three years that was older the exact than you were quote. in the first book. That's exactly what she said. Yeah. Some Remember that time in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer slash mm -hmm. Philosopher's Stone? Yeah. I'm three years older than you were. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, there are enough Thestrals for them all to go. So they hop on the Thestrals and fly away. And that is the end of chapter 33 and the end of this episode of Potterless. So, Hannah, how are you feeling about these chapters? I just, they're so, like, the first two chapters are, like, more satisfying. These three chapters are lead up to a climax that we're not going to get to. It's like, damn it. <laughs> There's, like, all of the stuff, all of the stuff is about to happen. And all of the revelations about the degree to which this is or is not a trap. And all of the revelations about which characters will or will not die. And all of the revelations about what actually happened to Umbridge. It's all, it's all yet to come. I still think that the most important scene in these chapters is the scene where Hermione pushes back against Harry's impulse to act impulsively. Um, yes. And Harry gets really mad at her and shouts her down. Mm -hmm. um, he really does. And I think no matter which one of them turns out to be right, I think that's a really important development in their friendship. Like Harry has always been the one who takes charge. Like Harry decides mm -hmm. when they're going to act and how and like everybody else comes along. And this is a moment when... Hermione, at least, is starting to say, like, mm, maybe your leadership in our little friend trio isn't totally unquestioned. Like, maybe your plans are sometimes bad. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. It's good. It was a good moment because the whole time Harry was, like, freaking the fuck out and yelling at Hermione and basically saying, like, Hermione, you're dumb. Mm -hmm. And she kept a level head the whole time mm -hmm. and really just tried to reason with him, like, look... Yes, it might take a little bit extra time, but we really should check because it could be him trying to play a trick on you. And she laid out all her reasons of exactly why. Like the 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 amount of patience that Hermione has is impressive. Mm -hmm. It is very easy for her. It would have been so easy for her just to be like, no, Harry, and yell back at him. But mm -hmm. she just reasoned with him and laid out exactly why she thinks that they should go with her approach and why what the concerns with Harry's reasoning and line of thinking is. And it was really impressive yeah. to see the way she handled it. And you're right. I think it was a really good moment for the book and a really good moment for their friendship just to be like, look, sometimes you got to take a step back and take a deep breath and think about things more critically. Mm -hmm. You can't be so impulsive all the time. It's not always going to work out for you. Yeah. Yeah. I've argued elsewhere that um, one of the things that we sort of track across the entire series is the development of uh, Harry and Ron and Hermione as three very different kinds of heroes that have three very different skill sets. Um, like they're all Gryffindors, so they're all like, you know, brave and courageous and want to do the right thing, but they all go about it in really different ways. Yes. And Harry is more and more decentered as like the only right way to do things. And more and more it becomes important to sort of recognize the different kinds of heroism that really all of the other characters bring to bear, including like that's going to be important in Neville and in Ginny and in. Luna yeah. takes a takes an army. Yeah, it really does. It takes a Dumbledore's army. Well, thank you so much for being on these episodes. It was a, it was a really fun time. I'm glad that you uh, got to be sassier this time around. <laughs> now I, that get, you're feeling I mean, the podcast better. medium doesn't pick up the number of times I was just silently shaking my head at you. That's true. It's yeah, I feel like we need it. We needed a counter. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I should have I should have mm -hmm. taken notes and then added a little sound effect every time yeah. you like rolled your eyes or something. Yeah, there was <laughs> there was a lot of it. <laughs> it would have been good. But yes, thank you so much for joining. Is there uh, any of your particular podcasting things you want to share to the internet to check out? Yeah, for sure. You can check out the uh, Harry Potter podcast that I co-host with my friend Marcel at 
uh, ohwitchplease.ca um, or ohwitchplease on Twitter. And um, my other podcast I make, Secret Feminist Agenda, is coming back in January. Nice. Um, you can check that out at secretfeministagenda.com or, you know, on the on the on the podcast internet yeah same goes for potterless if you just search potterless on any of your podcast apps you'll find us all our social media same thing and you can go to potterlesspodcast.com but hannah thank you so much for joining and listeners thank you so much for listening and until next time as they say in the harry potter world before they you know do the the toss for quidditch wizard on add another head shake count <laughs> another <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoy Potterless and you want to help us grow, the two best things that you can do are tell a friend or a loved one about the podcast or leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Both help the podcast so much, and I can't thank you enough for those of you who've already done so. Potterless was created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Andreas Ozelby, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vanderslice, Sadie Bear, Emily Whiffen, Jesse Horgan, Maggie Zobazek, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkes, Daisy Carton, Stubber, Klaus, Sir Lopu, Michael Butte, Sean, Jones, Alexander Stark, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Chiotto, and Marchismo. Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want to find us on social media, just search for Potterless Podcast, and we're on all of your preferred podcasting apps, as well as Spotify. Thank you guys again, and until next time, Wizard on! Wizard on!